Sega are a company from our gaming past we often fondly remember for all of the daring decisions they would make when trying to win the console war. Nintendo vs Sega was a hot topic in the early 90s, with Sonic the Hedgehog leading the Mega Drive to success with his super speed and blast processing. Even many of the console's weird add-ons had their own strange charms, with devices like the Mega CD and 32X being continuously discussed as major parts in gaming story to this very day. Today, on the other hand, we are going to go way weirder than that and instead cover the Sega add-ons that were either planned or have been at least talked about that never saw the light of day. If you think the 32X was a strange add-on, it doesn't have a patch on what's coming up in this content. So, bearing this in mind, I am Lady Decade and these are unreleased Sega console add-ons. Old school Sega consoles and peculiar system add-ons are a combination that is famously associated together much like Batman and Robin, The Undertaker and Kane, or Tony Blair and George W. Bush. The two share a special relationship with it being difficult to think of one without the other. The 16-bit Sega Mega Drive or Genesis as it's known in the Old Testament would be the king of Sega consoles when it came to these sometimes silly add-ons. There was of course the Mega CD that played CD games and added hardware functionality such as a faster CPU and graphic enhancements, such as sprite scaling and rotation as well as opening up the possibility to even play audio CDs and CD plus G discs. Further to this, there was the infamous 32X, the American-developed hardware which looked to extend the lifespan of the Genesis by presenting a low-cost option for 32-bit games, attempting to circumvent the needs of tight-fisted consumers who did not want to pay out for the Sega Saturn. The mind still boggles. Further to all this, there was a Master System Converter, which allowed for 8-bit Master System games to be played on the hardware. And there was even the Sega Channel, a discontinued online game service developed for the Genesis that served as a content delivery system. This is certainly something I want to make a video about in the future on this channel. So with all of these different add-ons, where did the disk drive slot into this? Yes, that was an intentional, very intentional, very clever pun. <laughs> slot. Well, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, then you may already be aware that we have covered disk drives for other systems in the past on here, with perhaps the most famous example being produced by Nintendo for their 8-bit Famicom hardware. The Famicom Disk System was introduced because floppy disks were both cheap to produce and rewritable. Part of Nintendo's distribution relied on their disk writer kiosks located in stores throughout the country, whereby gamers could buy games written over existing ones. Due to Nintendo's disk cards being fragile, piracy becoming rampant, disk kiosks taking up too much space in stores, and advancements in technology making cartridges both cheaper and easier to produce, Nintendo would discontinue its disk system after just a few years. So what did Genesis plan to do that Nintendo didn't? Interestingly, the canned Sega Mega Drive disc-based add-on was not Sega's first jaunt at the disc-based rodeo, with them first bringing out a disc-based hardware add-on as early as 1984, before the Famicom disc system even existed. This hardware, known as the Super Control Station SF7000, was created to add to Sega's SC3000 home computer. Sega's home computer is equivalent to their first ever Sega SG-1000 home console. The SF7000 would allow its owners to run software off 3-inch floppy disks, as well as also enhance the Sega platform in other ways too, such as adding a further 64KB of RAM, 8KB of ROM, a Centronix parallel port and an RS-232 serial port. This technology is considered both a rare and expensive today since the Super Control Station was a commercial failure. 
Its main shortcoming was put down to relying on the 3 inch floppy disk format rather than the more common 3.5 inch or 5.25 inch formats. Before we get to the Mega Drive disk drive, Sega did experiment with another disk based add on though. This brings us to the Sega Master System Disk System, another weird cancelled add on which I've made a video about in the past on here. This drive was set to sit beneath the main Master System console, much like the Sega Mega Drive's Mark 1 of the Mega CD. There's even a closed off expansion port present beneath the 8 bit hardware that can be seen where this would have attached. The device would have provided the Master System with greater storage capacity for games and could have been more commercially viable than its predecessor if it had relied on a more common disc format. We can speculate that, like the Famicom Disk System, the number of moving parts in these things would have made failure rates high, load times slower than with cartridge-based media, and discs were still fairly expensive to produce. So, taking all of this into account and the cost of an expensive add-on itself, it begins to make sense why Sega would shelve this idea. This then brings us on to the next chapter in Sega's disk drive history and the part you were all waiting for, the Mega Drive Disk Drive. The Mega Drive Disk Drive or Mega Drive Floppy Disk Drive as it was formerly referred to is another piece of canned Sega hardware that was designed to utilise the 3.5 inch floppy format, a format which was becoming increasingly cheaper as time progressed. The Floppy Disk Drive, or FDD, as Sega commonly abbreviated it to, would have fit nicely in an expansion port located on the system's right-hand side, the very same expansion port that would later be utilised for the Sega Mega CD. There is one source out there mentioning that Sega co-developed this hardware with Sony, but more on such a quote shortly. The most extensive piece of information we have regarding this device was published in the January 1989 issue of Beep magazine. However, unfortunately, it's all written in Japanese, meaning the video has to end here. Psych. Very good. Very good. Okay, then. Thanks to the efforts of MDShock.com, in 2018 the article was translated into English, meaning we can now understand what was written within this glorious scoop. Beep would end up visiting Sega's headquarters in Japan where they would interview Shigeo Kamata, who worked on the home video sale side of things for Sega, and Hideki Sato from Sega's hardware research and development division. Sato, as we all know, is an absolute legend within the gaming industry, with him and his team being credited for creating the majority of Sega consumer console hardware. This includes the SG-1000, Master System, Mega Drive, Saturn and Dreamcast. Sato played a key role in every generation of Sega hardware. Speaking about the floppy disk drive, they would outline we have a prototype ready, but the problem is the cost. We want to make it at the same level as the main console, but that's going to cost a lot of money for children. They'd be able to buy four games for the same price, so we have a big responsibility to make the right decision. Basically, we're hoping that the memory shortage ends soon, but either way, we will release the FDD around next spring once the market settles back down. Further in the article, the main purpose of the FDD is revealed, with its existence looking to allow for the Mega Drive to be used for more than simply gaming, essentially repositioning the system to function as a budget PC by pairing the FDD with a keyboard. They would state, We are planning on releasing the keyboard at the same time as the modem and the FDD. When you connect these three to the Mega Drive, it will become a complete computer. It appears the intention with this add-on, in typical Sega fashion, was to just keep on piling on more and more add-ons, including the introduction of a graphic tablet which could be used in tandem with the disk drive and could be plugged into the system's controller port. The Sega employee stated regarding this, 
we're preparing a graphic tablet and a standard joystick. The joystick is being developed jointly with another company, so that will depend on when they finish it, but we expect it to come out around March. UK magazine Rays would also report on the disk drive with them writing, Sega are designing a floppy disk drive to plug in here, and there's already a keyboard and modem for the Mega Drive. It seems Sega may have an Amiga beta on their hands. Well, not in the UK at least. As covered in my Amiga CD32 video in the past, the Amiga hardware managed to outsell the Sega Mega CD add-on, with Commodore UK cheekily placing a huge advertisement on a billboard outside of Sega's headquarters that read, To be this good will take Sega ages, the cheeky bastards. EGM would also cover the disk drive adding to the discussion. The company is working on a disk drive and keyboard that can elevate this grand master of game systems into a full-fledged and very powerful personal computer. Although the add-on is rumoured to be very close to finished for the Mega Drive, it is uncertain when we'll see similar attachments for our Genesis. So what happened to this mysterious device? Well, EGM would report on the disk drive one final time in the future with them writing, Sega has ditched their plans to market the floppy disk drive system that Sony developed for them, and will instead unveil a true CD-ROM interface for their 16-bit heavy hitter next spring. So there you have it. According to EGM at least, the disk drive add-on was dropped in favour of a more innovative CD add-on. But when we bear in mind how different the intended functionality was between these two devices, I have a sneaking suspicion that there may have been more to this story than just that. Perhaps it was a case of Sega having the foresight to take note that game consoles doubling up as personal computers never really did seem like something that consumers were particularly interested in, and that's before discussing all of the disadvantages that come with a disc-based system, which held back the likes of the Famicom Disk System, Super Control Station and, later in history, the Nintendo 64 DD. Either way, this marks the end of another strange chapter in Sega's balmy hardware history, which begs the question, should I make a video looking at the Sega Saturn's floppy disk drive in the future? Sega did bloody love their system add-ons. The history of Sega and the Laserdisc media format goes way, way back. In fact, Sega Laserdisc based software would be around before Sega had even released a home console, with Sega showing off Laserdisc based arcade games such as Astron Belt at trade events such as the Amusement Machine Show of 1982. Since Laserdiscs have been dead for goodness knows how long, in case you were wondering, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a Laserdisc. Basically, it's a massive optical storage device that looks like a giant CD. These, however, were not fully digital and required the use of analog video signals, but would offer higher quality video and audio than both VHS tapes and Betamax. Sega would begin releasing multiple full motion video games in the arcade using laser discs, such as GP World or the impressive Time Traveler, which was a holographic game. Amongst the companies who would create Laserdisc players for these arcade formats would be Hitachi and Pioneer, who would form a massive part of today's story. You see, by November of 1988, Sega were already looking for ways to enhance the capabilities of their new Mega Drive home platform, similar to what Nintendo had done with their Famicom Disk system in 1986. At this moment in time, Sega would launch a joint venture with Pioneer to begin development of a system add-on for their Mega Drive that would take advantage of the Laserdisc format, much like their previous released arcade cabinets had done in the past. 
thinking about it, as strange as a concept as the LD console add-on would sound, it would not even be the first planned game console that would use the Laserdisc format. As prior to all of this, back in 1985, there was a menacing cancelled video game platform by RDI Video Systems that even featured artificial intelligence, allowing the machine to talk to consumers, much like HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. And no, I'm not making this up. This was all as scary as it sounds and certainly worth its own standalone video in the future. As for Pioneer's add-on that would turn the Mega Drive into a console that could accept laser discs, it was full steam ahead with other hardware manufacturers also experimenting at the time with strange video game storage media formats, such as Hasbro, who had a VHS-based console in the works with games such as Night Trap being in development for it as system exclusives. Research and development would continue to progress for the Laserdisc system add-on, with the Mega Drive even seeing a North American release as the Sega Genesis in the process. Individuals working on the hardware such as Masami Ishikawa, Hideki Okamura and Otomi Otakumi would soon begin to run into some setbacks. For starters, there were supply shortages for parts that would have sent the cost of the system motherboards through the roof, a problem we are all far too familiar with living in the post-apocalyptic year of 2021. You know, I have even heard rumours that Sony has released a PlayStation 5 but no one's ever seen one. Adding to issues around the development of this device were struggles with creating a suitable pin attachment to connect it to the Mega Drive's motherboard. If gotten wrong, the system would have been in great danger of overheating due to it never being originally designed to work with laser discs. Most obviously of all though, it was becoming quickly clear throughout development that laser discs were, well, a bit rubbish really, and with Sega being able to witness firsthand the successes that NEC were having with their new PC Engine CD-ROM add-on, it was certainly not necessarily looking like a sensible format to opt for. Finally though, it must be taken into account how giant this bloody add-on would have been. I mean, we often laugh today at the sheer size and bulk of the Sega Mega Drive Tower of Power with a CD player underneath and the 32X add-on slotted onto the top. Can you imagine an add-on that could fit one of these underneath it? That would be absolutely huge! So, obviously, work with Pioneer to create a Laserdisc add-on for the Sega Mega Drive would end, and work for the CD-based Mega Drive CD would commence in its place. Still though, Pioneer had its patents and concepts, so the story did not end completely here. As part of a brokerage deal, an agreement was made between Sega and Pioneer to allow for ROM compatibility of both Mega Drive and Mega CD games to be used within a brand new retooled Pioneer manufactured device. This would result in the Pioneer Laser Active, one of the most ridiculous gaming platforms to ever exist. The device that was ready by 1993 that was marketed as a multimedia device was an insane piece of hardware. While base models were released that could play Laserdisc based games and movies, there would also be Sega LD manufactured games such as Road Avenger and Time Gal. More insanely, the device would end up being modular, which is where its Mega CD and Mega Drive compatibility come into play. By purchasing an expensive add-on module, gamers could gain access to the entirety of Sega's 16-bit library. So what I guess is most crazy about this is that the Mega Drive went from having a Pioneer add-on to a Pioneer system instead having a Mega Drive add-on. One could argue that this was pioneering. Speaking of pioneering, this huge beast of a device and its capabilities did not end there, as in addition to allowing the device to play Sega games, a pack could be purchased to allow the system to play both PC Engine and PC Engine CD-ROMs as well. This machine was madness! And this was not even its final form, as there was a karaoke pack for, well, uh, karaoke, and a computer pack to allow for floppy disks. 
Despite all of its bells and whistles and allowing owners to experience games from across so many different platforms, the multimedia device was a massive commercial failure, shifting only 10,000 units. The failings are easy to put down to its ridiculously high price points, with the modules being much more expensive than the consoles themselves that they were imitating. A Mega Drive pack, for example, would have cost a 90s consumer a ridiculous $600. And that is on top of the close to $1,000 that the Pioneer Laser Active actually was. This was a system for the classes not the masses. But while we have both the Sega Mega CD and Pioneer Laser Active both around today, it is also extremely interesting to go back and look at both devices' roots by looking at the forgotten planned Sega Laser Disc add-on. It is certainly a quirky piece of history, as are the old Sega LaserDisc arcade games too. You never quite know what you are going to learn when exploring the interesting world of Sega hardware. Throughout the Saturn's lifespan, out of all of the game consoles on the market at the time, including both the Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64, the Saturn was the king when it comes to 2D gaming. This was in part due to the cartridge expansion slot that is located atop the back of the system where gamers could insert memory expansion cartridges so that the system could handle epic amounts of animation frames within its working memory. This is one of the reasons why perfect tag team action can be found in the likes of X-Men vs Street Fighter on the Saturn where it would need to be cut out completely with the gimped PlayStation port. Now this slot atop the system was at one point planned to be exploited even further. This is where the 64X comes in with the idea of not just using it to enhance 2D games but 3D games too. The very graphical style of games the western market was clamouring for at the time. This now brings us to an American based company known as Lockheed Martin, a company who are primarily known for their aerospace technology working alongside NASA as well as American defence technology. But what may surprise some is that Lockheed Martin was not just a specialist in real warfare but would also play a role in console warfare. America! F yeah! In the world of gaming, the company worked alongside Sega in creating the Sega Model 3 arcade board, which contained a Lockheed Martin Real 3D GPU. This technology from the defence specialists meant that Model 3 games were designed to push as many textured polygons as possible in real time, offering the most advanced graphical techniques on the market. The Model 3 board broke new ground at the time, offering better graphics than any console or even arcade platform at the time, which was highlighted further with techniques such as multi-sample, anti-aliasing, motion blur, facial animation, specular shading and multiple light sources. The Model 3 really was top banana. The intention was to use Lockheed Martin's technology within a cartridge for the Sega Saturn to deliver an experience closer in line with that of the Model 3. This would mean that potential could arise for games like Virtua Fighter 3 arriving on the Saturn. Next Generation magazine would report on the hype and rumours that were circulating around this technology that was predicted to have the possibility of increasing the Saturn's 3D graphical output by as much as up to 50%. Next Gen would state that these plans would have made the Saturn capable of bringing the graphics in line with the cancelled 3DO M2 Super Platform. These plans to supercharge the Saturn were allegedly in exploration prior to the Saturn even launching stateside, with Kalinsky and co, as pointed out previously, being underwhelmed by the system's architecture. A search for a solution was underway in order to provide the Saturn with better 3D graphics. Lockheed Martin and the expansion cartridge slot seemed like it could have been a way of dealing with this issue. 
Proof of this concept's existence would be highlighted further in 1997, with Electronic Gaming Monthly reporting the following. Yu Suzuki-san and the White Shirts at AM2 are currently knee-deep into the development of Virtua Fighter 3 for the Saturn, which will be released in Japan around October. The CD-based game is designed to run in conjunction with a 3D cartridge upgrade that plugs into the port on top of the Saturn. Can you say 64X? EGM would go on to further explain that the Lockheed Martin Corporation, the company that designed Sega's Model 3 arcade architecture, was currently working on a 64-bit cart which was based on the real 3D chipset along with, at the time, LMC's upcoming 3D accelerator for the PC. They would report the entire package was targeted to retail for 9,800 yen in Japan, about 90 US dollars with 6,000 yen of that for the CD and about 3,500 to 4,000 yen going towards the cart. They would go on to quip that Virtua Fighter 3 will be just a small taste of Sega's 64-bit console technology. Tying this back to some of the previous videos on this platform, they would also note that Sega had commissioned LMC to work on another project with them, which was codenamed Pluto which we now all know how that one went. In terms of Lockheed Martin's 64-bit cartridges, we now know that these things would never come into existence and instead Sega would opt to release the Sega Dreamcast. The 64X pictured here was no more than a mock-up to represent one of a series of tongue-in-cheek, fun, yet completely impractical ideas that Japanese magazine Famitsu could put forward to Sega themselves. You see, even in the mid-90s, without hindsight being necessary, people could see how balmy many of Sega's hardware decisions were. So the magazine were jokingly putting forward the idea of creating a 64X mushroom-shaped add-on to improve the capabilities of the Saturn. After all, it had worked so well for the Mega Drive. Sega of Japan would playfully respond to this idea by stating they thought that the idea was great but felt they could make plenty of games for the regular Saturn but would joke back that the chance of the 64X happening was about 30%. While the image in today's video was obviously part of an elaborate joke, as was Sega's response to this, all reports from the period illustrate that in truth, the 64X was much closer to becoming a reality than many may think, with the Lockheed Martin cartridge expansion offering something quite similar to the 32X. I guess that the joke 30% was actually pretty accurate. For full context with regards to today's tale, we need to head all the way back to Japan in 1983 and the birth of the console war between Sega and Nintendo. This would be the year that the iconic Nintendo Famicom would be launched, the very game console that would be sold elsewhere as the NES in subsequent years. On the 15th of July 1983, the Famicom would not be the only new console that would see a release that day, as Sega's SG-1000 gaming platform would also see a launch. This dual release was no coincidence. Basically, Sega had been tracking Nintendo's development progress with their new hardware, and feared that the Famicom's popularity would cause such a threat to the company that it would not be long until Nintendo were able to take away Sega's arcade market segment, their key area of earning at the time. While many instantly think of the Master System for being the 8-bit game console that went head-to-head -head with Nintendo, a different console from Sega, the SG-1000, was the first to do battle. It was not so long though before Sega would realise they were ill-prepared for such a war, and by 1984 the SG-1000 had been completely outpaced by the Famicom with its more advanced hardware. After all, the Famicom offered smooth scrolling, more colourful sprites and plenty of third-party support. 
Whereas Sega, on the other hand, were much more conservative than Nintendo and did not want to collaborate with third-party developers as they saw them as their arcade competition. Can you believe that? A time where Sega were more protectionist than Nintendo. Part of the reason as to why the SG-1000 was proving to be a bust was in part due to the fact that the hardware included was never intended to be used in a game console. But instead, just in Sega's first ever computer with a built-in keyboard. The SC-3000, which also saw a release in 1983. The Sega computer would be packaged and co-sold as the SG-1000 game console, purely on the basis that the Sega president, Hayao Nakamura, Yama learned of Nintendo's plans to release a games-only console, so the company came up with a quick plan to counter it. 1984 would bring the Sega SG-1000 Mark II, a revision of the original console hardware that would add the feature of being able to accept pocket-sized Sega cards as new playable gaming media, followed up by the Sega SG-1000 Mark III in 1985. A more powerful and technically impressive console that in 1986 would be given a new form factor and sold as the Sega Master System worldwide that year. As already mentioned in this video already, the entire point of these systems were all efforts to counter the Nintendo Famicom, a device that continued to dominate the Japanese market that seemed to only be picking up more and more momentum. In fact, 1986 would be the very same year that the Famicom would receive its first significant enhancement of its very own. A device I constantly end up referencing on here, the Famicom Disk System. The electronic contraption that sits underneath the console that took advantage of proprietary floppy disks called disk cards that offered up cheaper data storage. The add-on's new high-fidelity sound channel also offered support for these disk system games. So considering that Sega were chasing Nintendo in the home market, Sega would copy Nintendo again Right? Well, kind of, as a disk system for the Sega Master System was indeed seen as a step forward. However, what may come as a surprise to some is that Sega actually came up with a disk add-on for their home hardware prior to that of Nintendo. Going back to the Sega SC3000 home computer, Sega would manufacture a system add-on known as the Super Control Station SF7000. This technology that hit shelves in 1984, two years before the Famicom Disk System, allowed the SC3000 to run software off of three-inch floppy disks. The device would also enhance the Sega platform in other ways too, such as adding a further 64 kilobytes of RAM, eight kilobytes of ROM, a Centronix parallel port, and an RS-232 serial port. This was an early example of Sega doing what needed don't. As of today, it is said that the Super Control Station is very rare and expensive, in part due to its shortcomings. The device's commercial failings are often put down to the fact that it relied on a 3-inch floppy disk format, as opposed to the much more common 3.5-inch and 5.25-inch formats. Rather than repeat this mistake again when it came to planning a disc-based add-on for the Sega Master System, it was instead intended for a more powerful 8-bit hardware to feature a device that could run the more common 3.5-inch floppy disk format. From the images available of the technology, we can see that the floppy disk drive could be attached beneath the Master System console, resulting in a very similar aesthetic to that of the Sega Mega Drive with its Mega CD attached. In fact, it seems that the Master System was intended to feature an add-on since day one, because if you turn the system over, an expansion port can be found on the bottom of the console. However, if you remove the cover, it is notable that it has been blocked off, suggesting that the add-on was cancelled before the Master System itself reached many markets. Mysterious. 
If the floppy disk side had made its way onto the commercial market with the aid of three and a half inch floppy disks, it would have provided the Sega Master System with greater storage capacity for games. However, there are a range of influencing factors that may very well have added to this device being left on the cutting room floor. For starters, whilst these disks would have offered more storage, this would have arrived with the trade-off of slow disk access time, adding load times and making the master system function slower. With floppy disk drives featuring more moving parts than that of a cartridge slot, this also would have increased the risk of failure and mechanical issues when it comes to the master system running effectively. In 1986, three and a half inch floppies were also far from a cheap option when it came to storage mediums as they were still expensive to produce. So expensive discs for a likely expensive add-on with a lot of moving parts was far from ideal really as an add-on for a fairly cheap to procure 8-bit game console. By the point of paying for a master system and a disc drive add-on, gamers may well have just invested in a full home computer instead. According to an old article from the Japanese Famitsu magazine, the hardware would even be shown off at a US trade show back in the day, displaying that this device was very much a tangible object, rather than just the concept. Moving into the distant future of 2016, the Famitsu website provided coverage of a talk that took place at the Game On event, an expo that took place at Japan's National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation, where various guests from the gaming industry would talk about gaming history. Education, 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 yeah! The event would include talks from a gentleman who worked at Sega in the 80s and 90s, who would cover multiple elements of Sega's past. At this event, Yosuke Okanari would show up on the big screen projector an image of what he refers to as the Sega Master System FDD, which he even admitted he knew little about. However, it is awesome to see that this mysterious hardware still being referenced these many years on. As for the Master System, it never ended up needing a disk drive to become a success, as while it was never that much of a big hit console in either Japan or America, the Sega Master System would prove very popular in Europe. A fact that Masami Ishikaware, a man who worked in product research and development from 1979 onwards, was more than keen to point out at the event. With regards to the Master System disc-based add-on, this tower would not end in the 8-bit era, as future Sega console generations would bring floppy disc-based technology to the table, which I hope to cover in depth within a future episode on this channel. The Sega Dreamcast was an ambitious game console, which Sega was banking on becoming the company's saviour. After the failings with the commercially unsuccessful Sega Saturn, the company would rely on the world's most powerful console, featuring online capabilities, to bring home the bacon. This was the first game console ever made to include a built-in modular modem for the internet and online play, and for early adopters of the technology, it felt like the future was here. Since the Dreamcast had these features, additional peripherals, such as a keyboard and mouse, were released to make surfing on the information superhighway much smoother. Well, as smooth as what was possible in 1999 and the year 2000 anyway. But further to these, a more substantial device was developed to increase the Sega Dreamcast's capabilities even further, which is where the Sega Dreamcast Zip Drive comes in. A disc-based add-on that aesthetically mirrored the failed Nintendo 64 disc drive. Once again, Sega does what Nintendo. The Sega Dreamcast Zip Drive was developed by a company known as iOmega, a US-based company that specialised in data storage technology. 
The idea was conceived due to it being foreseen that some Dreamcast owners may demand more storage space, as the Zip Drive offered more space than Sega's servers when it came to saving emails, web pages, and internet files. Further to this, if the Sega Dreamcast had become a success and been on the market for more than just a couple of years, the disk drive could have been taken advantage of so that users could store video game DLC onto disks. To further substantiate this, it is on record that Quake 3 Arena had planned downloadable content that could have been saved using this technology. The zip drive would be announced in spring 1999 with a scheduled cost of $199 to hit shelves one year later in the year 2000. Utah-based iOmega intended to sell the disk drive itself at a loss, but a profit off the back of the disks themselves, selling them at $10 with a manufacturing cost of only $1. Iomega intended to bring their 100 megabyte zip disks over to the Dreamcast, which was storage media they had already produced for the PC, but with a slight modification to make it Dreamcast compatible. So to put this into perspective, common Dreamcast storage devices such as memory cards or even snazzy VMUs only had a capacity of 128 kilobytes, whereas zip drive disks would expand backup capabilities tremendously. According to DreamcastLive.net, the 100 megabytes provided by the zip drive would have allowed for players to download entirely new levels, maps, characters and modes, pretty much what we're used to getting with modern DLC. We might have even seen entire games downloaded to the zip drive. I'm not saying you would have been able to download Shenmue to a zip disk, but smaller games would have been a possibility. Just imagine popping in to Planet Web, navigating to store.dreamcast.net, and browsing a catalogue of minigames to download instantly to your Dreamcast. This was the future. Well, the future if so many of you weren't so poor that you couldn't afford a DVD player and had to wait for a PlayStation 2 instead. While speaking of the Sony PlayStation 2, it is of note that, like that system, the zip drive had a USB port, allowing for it potentially to be hooked up to further external storage devices such as flash drives and external hard drives, thus meaning a range of further possibilities that could be opened up. Sega Dreamcast Info Games Preservation.com outlines some of the development details regarding this mysterious device, including information from a software engineer going by the name of John M, who worked on the project. He would attend meetings with a Japanese businessman who was serving as an intermediary between iOmega and Sega, stating, We met him and he introduced us to the idea that iOmega could customise a zip drive for the Sega Dreamcast. This project gave me the opportunity to travel to Japan and meet Sega engineers there. He states that the project was launched and iOmega committed to developing the housing, electronics and software for the Dreamcast Zip Reader, adding, We weren't interested in making the case itself, only the reader. iOmega would supply the ATAPI drives to Sega and Sega would assemble the entire Dreamcast Zip Drive. IOmega would visit Japan twice throughout the development process, firstly to initiate and project and make joint technical decisions, and on a second visit to transfer the technology to Sega. So it sounds like it was a full steam ahead for the zip drive. Keith Slankard, a former director of iOmega's Beyond PC initiative, outlines that development of the zip drive would be completely finished and was ready to go into full production and they were simply waiting for the green light from Sega. But, as we now know, sadly these things were never to be mass-produced. 
When recently interviewed about the zip drive, Slankhard stated, I have not thought about the Dreamcast product in a long time. Yes, the prototypes were fully functioning and performed well in qualification testing. The product was ready to be approved for production. Sega decided not to move forward with the product. The price point and uncertainty of the use model were the likely concerns. Both the iOmega and Sega Engineering tested the drive. Sega did the operating system additions for user interface and to allow games to talk with the drive. iOmega did the low level drivers. I don't believe the Proto would work without the OS additions. Cross-referencing Slankard's statement with that of John M's, John provides further information with regards to why the Zip Drive never saw a full commercial release, despite the previous meetings with Sega seemingly going well. It is said that Sega of Japan's engineers would show the Zip Drive at a convention in Japan. During the same event, the marketing branch of the Japanese company was also present, but up until this moment had been completely unaware of the zip drive. It would transpire that iOmega had only been working with engineers from Japan and Sega of America, whereas other departments from Sega of Japan had been left in the dark. The marketeers at Sega of Japan saw absolutely no need for a Sega Dreamcast zip drive, despite the potential benefits which we discussed earlier on. This colossal communication cock-up paired with marketing's lack of faith in the hardware would cleanly spell its doom. John M does, however, note that as the hardware was being axed, Sega of America would give iOmega their full support, but their influence was not strong enough to change Sega of Japan's mind. So why did the zip drive get cancelled? Well, because Japan. So that just about rounds up the development and cancellation of the Sega Dreamcast zip drive. But what for the prototypes of this device, which are apparently in existence? Well, it is said that Sega of America, who supported the device, had one located within their offices, and an ex-Sega of America employee claims that they foresaw it as potentially great software for creating homebrew games. A game journalist named Adam Pavlaka, working on behalf of Next Generation magazine, was fortunate enough to see one on display at the Game Developers Conference, which he would report was fully functional. He even got to see demos running on them. One was a video of Panzer Dragoon Saga for the Sega Saturn showcasing video playback. The other showed off the zip drive's capabilities of both saving and loading zips. At the US conference, he also recalls Sega of America promoting the hardware's homebrew potential. John M states that he too had a Dreamcast zip drive at one point, but thinks he just threw it in a dumpster after leaving his job at iOmega. Just chucking a rare prototype in the bin? Ouch! One would finally surface online in the year 2007, whereby a seller would attempt to shift it online for $10,000. While for such a rare piece of video game history, this may sound like chump change to some, with this being prior to the retro gaming boom, it appears that no buyer at such a price was found. In fact, the website Destructoid would even go so far as to mock the listing, pointing out that there were no bids, adding the hardware does absolutely nothing and that no game or other software was ever completed for it. They would quib, it seems a bit silly these days, but it's a reminder of how much things have changed. We are now popping two gig memory sticks into portable game systems and cameras without giving it a second thought. I do not know what is more ridiculous that people these days are wanting to pay through the roof for common as muck GameCube games or people back then not wanting to purchase the very rare prototype. God, how gaming has changed.
Moving 11 years into the future, into 2018, a year in which the general public very much do care about retro gaming, a prototype would once again surface on eBay, selling in just one day, at the still very humble, in my opinion, price of €4,225. While it was reported at the time that the console was sold to a San Francisco museum, this information seems to be becoming increasingly more likely false, bearing in mind that we have not seen this device surface anywhere in the last four years. The sad truth is that the hardware is likely being held in the fat, sweaty grip of a selfish collector behind closed doors, or even worse, in the hands of a greedy NFT loving speculator. But if you personally know where one of these things currently can be found, then please let us all know in the comment section down below.